Hi everybody, so today we're going to review some of the things we learned about angles in class today and get you ready for what we're going to be learning about involving angles tomorrow. So take a second and recall from class, how many letters do we usually use to name angles? If you said three letters, then you are absolutely correct. Here, in the picture that we have on the slides here, there's multiple ways that we could name this ang the angles here. If we wanted to talk about the whole big angle, so if we wanted to talk about the entire angle here, we would call that angle ABC. We could instead also call it angle CGA. They are both the same things. When you're naming angles, the important thing is that you name the angle with the vertex in the middle. So angle AGC or angle CGA would name the same exact angle. But what about if we wanted to refer to the two smaller angles, angle one and angle two? Let's start with angle one. How do you think we would name angle one? If you said, angle CGB, you are absolutely correct, or angle BGC, angle CGB is talking about the blue angle, angle one, and angle BGC is talking about the same angle. And finally, if we wanted to name angle two, which is, appears to be slightly larger than angle one, but we never trust diagrams or make assumptions based on diagrams in geometry. Diagrams can be deceiving. But if we wanted to name angle two, take a second, how would you name angle two? If you said angle AGB or angle BGA, you are absolutely correct. Angle AGB is talking about angle two in green, and angle BGA is talking about the same exact angle, angle two. So notice how naming is extremely important, especially when we have a larger angle that can be split into smaller angles as well. Because if we just named this angle, angle G, I'll write that down here, angle G, nobody would know what we were referring to. Are we referring to the whole big angle in red? Are we referring to angle one in blue, or are we referring to angle two in green? In fact, if you just name it angle G, so with one letter, it's most of the time going to be taken as you're referring to the whole big angle. So it's important to use three letters whenever you're naming angles. That way you'd be as precise as possible, and nobody has any question about which angle you are naming. Notice how the two smaller angles that angle AGC is broken into, so angle one and angle two, notice how they are right next to each other. They share a vertex and a side. Both angle one and angle two share side GB. See, it's part of angle one, and it's also part of angle two. We call these two angles adjacent angles. So once again, angle one and angle two are adjacent angles. What that means is that they share a vertex and a common side. And you can think of it as they're right next to each other. Notice angle one and angle two, they're right up next to each other. They're touching each other. That's what adjacent means, sharing a vertex and a side in common. This is just a refresher on some of the types of angles that we saw in class. So we have an acute angle. Do you remember what that is? It's an angle that is less than 90 degrees. So let me write that down. Less than 90 degrees. Do you remember what the right angle is? If you said it's exactly equal to 90 degrees, you are absolutely correct. And then that choose angle, is an angle that is larger than 90 degrees. We have a straight angle here. If you recall from class, a straight angle adds up to 180 degrees. You can think of it as a whole straight line, 180 degrees in a straight line. 
And then we have reflex angles that we don't really talk about too much in geometry, so I'm kind of going to skip over that a little bit. And full rotation angles, that just means a whole circle. So I'm going to write here, a whole circle. And as we probably know from past math classes, or if you don't know, now you know, a whole circle is 360 degrees. Anytime you're moving around in a full circle, it's 360 degrees. So this kind of angle would be 360 degrees. We also talked about some other kinds of angles very, very briefly during class. So I'm just going to mention them. We talked about supplementary angles. Sorry for my messy handwriting. Supplementary angles. And we talked about complementary angles. So remember that supplementary angles are two angles or more angles, it doesn't have to be just two, but I'll just write two angles that add to 180 degrees. And complementary angles are two or more angles that add to 90 degrees. So if I give you an example over here, if I have a 45 degree angle and I also have another 45 degree angle. Not only are these two angles congruent to each other, but we can also say that these two angles are complementary because they add to 90 degrees. If they instead added to 180 degrees, we would say that they are supplementary. I drew these two angles separately, but there's no need for them to be separate. They definitely could have instead have been adjacent angles, still add to 90 degrees, still complementary. And once again, if the angles instead added to 180 degrees, they would be supplementary instead of complementary. Complementary angles add to 90 degrees, supplementary angles add to 180 degrees. Now we're moving over into constructions, and the first construction that we're going to see today is copying an angle. I am using the open close compass in this video, but don't worry, in class tomorrow we're going to go over the same exact construction and we're going to be using the flat red compass so that you guys can see it both ways. So notice here that I have an angle, angle A, and that's the angle that I'm going to be copying. So I'm going to be taking whatever angle measurement is here, I don't know, I don't have a protractor, I didn't measure it, and I'm going to be copying it and moving it down here and making an angle with that same measurement out of the ray that's here. Now, you guys might be saying, wait, but we're starting with two rays that are different sizes. Trick question there. Rays are infinite. Notice the arrow on the end. So rays go on forever and ever and ever. We're not interested in the length of the ray because lengths don't have measure. R rays don't have measure. They go on forever. They're inf infinite. What we're interested in is the actual measurement of the angle and bringing it down over here. So let's do it. So let me try to get a different color over here. Colors are good. There we go. I changed my compass color. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to put my compass on point A and just adjust my compass so I can actually get it onto point A from this angle. There we go. It's on point A. And all I'm going to do is open my compass a little bit so that I can get an arc. Oops. Why is this not writing? There we go. So I can get an arc that just crosses the angle. That's all that I needed to do, cross the angle. I'm going to move it away so you guys can see. Without changing the measurement, all I'm going to do, with my compass open to the same width, I'm just going to take my compass and move it down to point D over here, and I'm just going to draw the same exact arc over here. Great. We call that our reference arc. It's going to help us find the actual angle measurement. So now on my original angle, I'm going to just take a second and label this over here angle uh, point B and point C. And it doesn't matter what letters you use, I just used B and C. So now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use points B and C to measure how big the angle is. So that way I can bring that measurement down here to point, let's call that point E. So let me change the color of my compass. That will make it a little bit easier to see. And let me pick up my compass and it's a little bit small, so it's a little bit hard to see, but we'll do it in class again. I'm going to put my point, my compass point on B, 
and I'm only going to open it up to where C is. So I'm just measuring with my compass the width from B to C because that's how big the angle is. And I can make a small arc here. I should make a small arc here to show that I measured that length from B to C. Without changing my compass width because I already have the measurement from B to C on it, that's the measurement of the angle, I'm going to move down here over to point E. And all I'm going to do is using that same width that we just measured, I'm just going to make another arc. And then I'm all done. All I need to do now is draw a ray right through that point of intersection. Oops. Right through that point of intersection. I can label that point if I want to. I can label that point over here, point F. And now we have two angles that should be congruent to each other. So let me write that down. Congruent. So angle BAC or angle A, you can call it because it's not split up into smaller angles, is congruent to angle FDE, or you can call it angle D. Angle A is congruent to angle D. The next construction that we're going to be doing is a bit of a quick one. We're going to be bisecting angle A. Remember that bisect means to split into two equal or two congruent parts, so we're going to be taking this angle and splitting it into two congruent parts. So let's see how we are going to do that with our compass. Oh no, what popped up there? Okay, so first I'm going to take my compass and I'm going to move it over to point A. And I'm going to open my compass. It doesn't matter how much. I'm just going to open it a little bit. And all I'm going to do is make an arc. We call this the reference arc. The width did not matter. Notice now that we had two points of intersection. We had the point of intersection here and the point of intersection here. I'm going to take my compass and I'm going to put it on one of those points of intersection. I'm just going to open my compass a little bit more. It doesn't really matter. The width here doesn't matter. And all I'm going to do is make an arc. Using this same distance without changing the distance of my compass, I'm going to move over to that other point of intersection and I'm just going to make the same arc. Notice that there is a point where my two arcs meet. Since my arcs were congruent, I should have just split the angle into two congruent parts. Let's draw a ray through it. And that will be our bisector. So now we have cut this angle into two congruent parts. So if we give it a name, so if I find a point here and I call this B, and I find a point here and I call this C, and let's call this point over here point D, the point where the two arcs intersected before, we can say that angle BAD, sorry, it's a little bit difficult to write on here, angle BA, oops, oh no. Let me get my pen. Angle BAD, so that's this angle right here, is congruent to angle CAD, which is this angle over here. I can give them numbers if that's easier. Angle 1 is congruent to angle 2 because we just bisected the whole angle BAC. This next construction is really, really simple. All we're going to be doing is bisecting this line segment here or splitting the line segment into two equal parts, two congruent parts. So I'm just going to stick my compass point on one of the endpoints of the line segment, and I'm going to open up my compass to any distance, but it should be about a little bit more than halfway down the line segment, but it doesn't matter the exact amount you open it. And all I'm going to do is swing a really big arc, and that's it. Using the same distance, whatever I have my compass open to, all I'm going to do is move my compass over to the other endpoint, and swing the same exact arc. Then, I'm just going to draw my bisector right through the points of intersection. Oh no, I completely missed those points of intersection. Let's try that again. Here's one of the points. Here's another one of the points. Let me use my straight edge. And let's get it as best as I can right down the center. Let me move that over a bit. And there we have it. We have the bisector of this line segment. So what that means is the line segment is split into two congruent parts. And also, if you notice, right angles are formed in the corner. 
So we actually call this construction not only the line, bis line segment bisector, but the perpendicular bisector of a line segment. So I wrote it over here on the side, perpendicular bisector. Remember that this symbol over here that you're seeing stands for perpendicular. Not only does it split the line segment into two congruent parts, but it also creates right angles. Our last construction that we're going to be doing for this video is we're going to be drawing a line that's perpendicular to the line here and that also passes through the given point P. Remember, if we're constructing a line perpendicular to this one, it's going to create right angles where it intersects with this line because perpendicular lines form right angles. The first thing I'm going to do is take my compass and place it on point P. I'm going to open my compass any distance, it doesn't matter, it just needs to be large enough so that when I draw an arc, it intersects the line in two spots. So let's see if this is big enough, if this is wide enough to open my compass. When I swing an arc, notice, yes, it does hit the line in two spots. I'll mark those spots for us right here. Now, all we need to do is take our compass, oops, let me get my compass back, and I'm going to put my compass on one of those two points of intersection. I'll do the left-hand one first. Now, it doesn't matter. Oops, I didn't mean to make that arc. There we go. So it doesn't matter how wide I have my compass open, but it should be about three quarters of the distance from this point to that point. But it doesn't matter the exact length you have it open, so don't worry. And all I'm going to do, let me use a different color so we don't get confused by the arcs, is swing an arc down here. Now, using the same distance that I have it open to already, I'm just going to move my compass over to the other end point here, and I'm just going to swing an arc until it meets the other one. Notice I now see the point where my two blue arcs intersect. That's right here. So all I have to do now is take my straight edge and draw a line that goes right through that point of intersection. And notice the line that goes through this point of intersection of the arcs also passes right through point P. So what I have done now is I have created a line that is perpendicular to the line that we were given that goes through point P. And check it out here. The right angles are created where the two lines meet, which means the two lines are in fact perpendicular. If you're a little bit confused, don't worry, we'll be doing all of these constructions tomorrow in class. Make sure to bring your questions with you.